this last session, I mean, I've, I've been deeply moved and challenged by all of the sessions so far, but this is one that I'm actually personally deeply emotionally invested in. I have a daughter. She's 27, almost 27. She has never lived without the threat of climate change hanging over her. When she was growing up and we'd drive into the country and both her part, my, my partner, her mother and I work in the climate space, whenever we started having that conversation, she would shut it down. Like many kids of her generation and subsequent generations, she suffers from anxiety. She doesn't want to talk about certain things. She's very smart, very capable, but there are some issues which are deeply traumatic. She's also active politically, but not on the climate front. In recent years, climate activism has taken a change, it's taken a turn very much for the better. It's moved out of the hands of the large climate organisations or environmental organisations. It's become a much more random field and a field which has been populated by young people. From Greta Thunberg to climate emergency, which is largely driven, I think, by young people, by AYCC in Australia, by SEED, we're seeing a new voice emerge. And to be honest, I'm, I'm surprised at how respectful that voice still is, given the inadequacies, given the, the inability of policymakers and people of my generation to actually grapple with an issue that's been staring us in the face for over three decades. So it's critically important that we pay attention to an unencumbered voice, people who are actually able to speak to us directly without all the encumbrances of mortgages and job anxieties and the rest of it, you actually see the issue much more clearly, I think, than most of us, by which I mean people of my generation who are part of the problem, actually do. By listening and by allowing greater power to the generations that are coming through, I think we've got a much better chance of actually tackling the problem. So in this panel, we're going to hear from younger voices about their hopes for the future and also the changes that they want to see. The panel is going to be introduced by Nat Byrne, again, whom I'm sure you know. Next, he's moderator for this Youth Perspective panel, and it's the last panel for the day. Nate's the weather presenter in the ABC News Breakfast. Uh, he's a meteorologist and oceanographer and science communicator, so he really knows what he's talking about in terms of the science, and an all-round ray of sunshine. Um, Nate understands how, well, I mean, you know, climate present, um, weather presenter. He knows how climate change is changing and also the stories that go with it and how we can work together to actually deal with the problem. Nate, over to you. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, please let it be known, I am not here as the youth of today. <laughs> I know it's deceiving. It's a full face of makeup. Um, uh, hello and welcome to this very last panel of the day, which arguably could have been the first, I reckon. Uh, it's wonderful to be here for the uh, Climate Futures Summit and the Youth Perspectives panel is incredibly important. I'd like to start by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, the people on whose lands we meet today, and I, of course acknowledge their elders past and present and their ongoing connection, never ceded, to uh, land the waters here and of course importantly the sky uh, which is what we're here to talk about today um that was such a lovely introduction as a way of warning um as uh, being a breakfast presenter i've been awake since 3 30 this morning uh so please be forgiving. Uh, the dimples won't go anywhere. They're glued on. But uh, if I stumble, my apologies are very, very much so. Uh, so today we're talking to some pretty incredible young people about their feelings about their activism and their work and how they're hoping to shape the future in terms of our changing climate and what we can do about it and what we should be doing about it importantly uh can i just remind everybody that we are recording and this is being streamed live around the world as well so uh, uh keep that in mind as as we're interacting today um the other thing is that we are going to have live q a from not only the room but also our audience online and wherever you are via slido so slido.com is where you want to be and the hashtag climate 
Futures Summit is the one for you. You can just use that QR code to get involved and get your questions. Uh, they can be upvoted. So if you see a question that's similar to one that you want, vote it up and I'll be trying to read from the top of the list as much as I can where uh, it's not a repeat of something we've already discussed. Okay, panelists. We've got four amazing people for you. Uh, now, sitting closest to me is Atina Schutz. Uh, she's from uh, she's a Pacific Youth Climate Leader. Uh, Tiani Adamson, an Indigenous Climate Reality Leader. Joe Fullwood is furthest from me. Is a Wattle Fellow, as is Imogen Senior, sitting just one in from Joe. Now these people are incredible. When I've, I've been look at, looking at the things that they've done, uh, we've we've got um, a, a Tina. She's in her first semester of law at, at the University of the South Pacific. She's a student researcher and climate activist. She's a member and uh, and a former awareness chair of the Pub, uh, Pacific Islands Students Fighting Climate Change, a youth organisation campaigning to seek an advisory opinion from the International Court of Justice on climate change. Right, if you're going to go anywhere, go to the top. Um, Tiani is a proud Torres Strait Islander woman descended from the Kororeg uh, nations of, the, of Thursday Island. She's a wildlife conservation biologist and works on a variety of projects to nurture country, find solutions to our climate crisis and advocate for First Nations justice and land rights. When I was a young person, I was interested in naps. <laughs> <laughs> Imogen, yeah, Imogen Senior, she's in her third year of studying politics and criminology in, Mel in Melbourne. Uh, Imogen, I think you you wrote your um, your bio for this. Uh, this grabbed my heart when I read it earlier. Imogen is anxious, passionate and angry about the lack of leadership and policy for the climate crisis in Australia. Imagine being asked to write a bio and that's your first line. Uh, keep that in mind as, as we go on. And Joe, finally, uh, is a research project officer and the marketing and communications director at the Oceania Cyber Security Centre. I was, yes, did, yes. Oh, I thought you were muttering because I'd gotten it wrong. My goodness. Uh, the OCSC, where he works as a cybersecurity capacity building, oh, works on cybersecurity capacity building for large ocean states in the Pacific and is responsible for the centre's sustainability strategy. These are young people with some heft and um, I think I need to stop talking and we need to start talking to you. Um, first of all, okay, we, we, we're going we're gonna to prime with some questions here. Uh, Atina, let's, let's start with you since you're here. You, you, okay, you're good. Sweet. What are some of the ideas that you would like policymakers and um, academics to be speaking about uh, when it comes to action? And more specifically, what do you think has been missing from the conversation so far? Shit. Is this on? Though? It should be. Testing? Okay. Yeah, you're good. Have a chat. Okay, well, um, good morning, everyone. Oh, sorry. Good afternoon. Oh. <laughs> Have you been up since three as well? <laughs> yeah, sorry, crack on. Oh, um, so yeah, just want to start off by saying, um, you know, climate crisis impacts are not new to everyone. In fact, they're quite well documented. And I also want to stress that um, uh, the climate change impacts also hit people differently and to a different extent. You know, some are more vulnerable than others and that they cannot easily adapt to climate change impacts without outside support. Some are not fully aware of the possible implications that certain climate actions will have on them. Um, some of them have higher, um, some people will have a higher risk of injury and um, health, um, harm to their health. And also, um, many have been um, historically marginalized in decision making spaces. So some of the things that I would love would be really great for policymakers and academics to look more into would be, um, you know, how to ensure that all people and countries are, are able to adapt to climate change and how to access the, you know, the, the, the needed support for that transition. And I think we will find that everyone requires a bespoke solution to, um, these, uh, to these problems as it's not a one size fits all situation. And in the event of irreversible impacts, such as like loss and damage, how do you ensure that the affected communities that contributed almost nothing to um, 
the climate crisis are able to gain reparations for that and you know how to provide redress for you know harm suffered as a result of climate inaction as well as action and how to ensure the widespread use of green technology and how to um, make it accessible to all and not just to the ones like who can afford to have it. Um, I realize that some places subsidize the use of solar panels. However, it's not really the case everywhere. And you know how to ensure that marginalized people are present in all levels of decision making and not relegated to the sidelines or as an afterthought. And that being said, um, I think that the thing that is missing in um, conversation is how to ensure equity in policies. And this equity relates to equity among individuals, equity among countries, and equity among generations. Uh, it can um, equity could be reflected through a rights-based approach in um, policymaking, and then, you know, you can do this by you know ensuring access to ensuring equal participation, access to justice, and you know um, an, equ an equitable transition from fossil fuels, and in other words, you know a situation that leaves no one behind. Thanks. Brilliant. Talking there very importantly about a uh, lack of equity, um, Tiani, your speciality, your area of interest is in the First Nations experience. Uh, what tools have you used to put to work for the most impact, the the, the best and and the, and the most equitable? Thank you. So I'd also like to acknowledge the beautiful traditional owners of the land that we meet on today, the Wurundjeri and Wurrung peoples of the Kulin Nations. I'm really lucky to have flown into beautiful Nam here and pay respects to all other First Nations mob in the room and as well to my ancestry, which is descended from the Kaurag Nations right at the top of Australia, past far north Queensland and into the good part of Queensland again. <laughs> <laughs> First Nations people were born as activists. It's embedded in our way of being, knowing and doing. You can't be a traditional owner and not just, we, we call it a traditional owner, but in, in my lens, it's just being an owner, right? These people are still the owners of the land that we're on right now and today always was and always will be Aboriginal land on Australian soil here or Torres Strait land up the top. So we're born as activists and it's it's embedded into our way of being, knowing and doing we're not separate from the country that we're on and working with young people who have that mindset ingrained in their sense of identity and being and knowing and doing is such a gift and a pleasure. I feel really grateful to be able to work in the space. It's also incredibly devastating because, as you said, sis, the people who are often contributing the least are often being affected the most. The Torres Strait Islands are only one metre above sea level, which means that the next few years will be really trying times potentially some of the first people that will be climate refugees and that has a huge impact on the emotional, spiritual and mental health of our people and our nation. So in terms of tools for building and uplifting and capacity building within communities, it comes down to firstly that relationship building for myself. So genuine relationship building without a intention or a an, in, in, an incentive for myself or for an outcome. It's about understanding the needs and the issues faced by community members and by individuals in these spaces and creating that organic relationship and then being able to uplift culture and identity into spaces. So I do work with climate reality leaders and with Seed Mob as well. I'm the state coordinator in SA and some stuff for the Uluru Statement from the Heart. And something that's really important about these spaces for First Nations mob is ensuring that unlike some Western education system areas where you walk in the door and it's like, whatever you've learned in your life, leave that right here. Now you're in this space and this is who you are and this is what you'll learn. It's creating these spaces in these unique areas to understand that your culture and your identity and what you know and your wisdom from your ancestry and your upbringing that's within you is so incredibly important to the fundamentals of your knowledge system and who you are, that no matter how old you are, that has extreme value into who you are and how you navigate this world and the paths in front of you. You don't need extreme amounts of study in a Western education system to know that. We know that some of our youngest people have this great connection and understanding of the land and the climate and they can tell most of us in this room the ways that they've seen adaptations and evolution across the landscape better than a lot of climate scientists could. So it's about understanding the identity and the wisdom and knowledges and showing young people and young First Nations people that that has importance and vitality in these spaces and to be able to uplift and connect with that. 
Also accessibility is a huge thing in these spaces, being able to give things like climate training, making sure that it's accessible for our mob. So not just in terms of does it cost money to attend or not, but do people have access to resources like Wi-Fi? Are people willing to fly or drive off of country to attend these things? Can places and spaces attend trainings on their own country? Can facilitators visit communities rather than always taking people off of country into big cities and institutionalising them in some sense as well? So it's about creating spaces that foster the vulnerability of First Nations people and also the vulnerability of youth who are already feeling potentially quite nervous and anxious to be in these spaces and stepping up. I know that personally as a First Nations person, and I've been doing a fair bit of public speaking lately, but it's an odd thing to be asked for your uh, perception or understanding because we listen to our old people and we have to go through a cultural obligation or kinship to be able to be listened to in our communities. And so it's really nice to be able to have things like this where it's seen that our understanding and knowledge system is of value to others and to be able to step into that place and try and do it justice because we stand on a lineage, all of us, of hundreds and hundreds of years of people who have survived and have been resilient through evolution and changing times. We've seen huge environmental landscape changes and there's still obviously more to come, but one thing that we are really good at is fostering community and adapting together. So that's sort of some of the community and nation building and bringing together the understanding that our young people aren't clean slates, ready to just be slammed with whatever information we would like to institutionalise them with, but bringing that whole vulnerability and knowledge and understanding to these spaces and fostering spaces that accept and bring that into both worlds of knowledge and understanding as well. It's really important the way that you talk about getting those conversations to the people where they are and finding ways to do that. And technology, you know, sitting here in 2022, streaming live uh, on the internet is, is something that's enabling us to do that if they have access. But given that if young people are really good at technology. I'm, really. not, I'm horrible at it. Do, no, no. <laughs> oh, I, I've got an iPad that I don't know how to use and, and it doesn't have any questions yet, which I'm hoping is just because everybody's really keen at listening rather than writing questions, but feel free to. Um, uh, but tech, I want to go down that path to Joe, actually, because you're, you're our tech man. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> Using it to connect young people, to to empower them, to get them organised, to to do the things that they need to. Do. What do we need when it comes to that technological? Like these are platforms. What is it? How do we move from here? Yeah, thanks for the question and thanks for having me. Um, so, I think it's a really interesting question to pose, and I'm glad I'm going after Tiani because I think for me solving many climate problems is a community issue and a connections issue and a communications issue. And I think tech definitely has a massive role to play in that. But I also think there's a conversation to have around that role can be good and bad. So I think, you know, looking at social media and digital platforms, there's a tremendous negative effect they can have on those three things of connection community and communications and they can actually divide us more than the good that they do so i think it's part of this is acknowledging that and acknowledging that there's an innate like danger in relying on technology um but in a more positive sense i think covid has shown that there are tremendous things that tech can do and when we're all stuck at home i think there was certainly many platforms and communities I joined online and I saw it really bringing us together. And I think there's a real future there of international, particularly community building that can be done. And I think Climate Reality Project is an excellent example of that. They took everything online. I did my training online during COVID and now I have a network of amazing people around the world that I can connect with and draw inspiration from and expertise from. And so I think those platforms and they're popping up everywhere can do real good and you know social media gives you know we're talking about equity before i think it's a real voice for voices that have not been heard typically um 
So indigenous voices, voices in countries outside the global north um, to get their message out and to get it across that way. So I think there's tremendous opportunities in tech, but it's also can be a downside. And so we really have to have a, you know, insightful conversation about that. One of the downsides might be, and I think we perhaps get into this later, is, is sometimes fracturing of of a consistent single voice, uh, which might let that voice get a bit louder. Uh, and actually, Imogen, this is where we need to go, I think. Um, how do we make sure that once we've got these voices together and talking, and how does that get into the ears of policymakers and importantly, into policy? Thank you so much. I think it's an excellent question. Um, Thank you. No, please. Oh. <laughs> um, I think for me, there are a lot of really practical, tangible measures we can take that take young people's voices to important places. Um, there's a lot of conversations about currently lowering the voting age and perhaps having optional voting for 16 and 17 year olds who are incredibly politically engaged and incredibly anxious and also incredibly angry. Um, and I think ideas such as that and um, ideas around a youth parliament and proper collaborative design of policy as opposed to just considering young people as, as one group to consult along the way. Um, and for a lot of these, I consider the ball, no offence, to be in, in your court. <laughs> I think it's amazing the level of um, organisation and passion and, and platform that young people already have. And we don't have to redesign or reinvent the wheel um, when we're figuring out ways to hear young people's voices. We have incredible organizations across this country, um, like AYCC, Seedmob, um, and Yakvik, and, and organizations like that, that mean that a lot of the time, the problem isn't just in the design of the structure um, and the way that we're being listened to, but in the um, decision makers themselves. And I think for me, I work with, um, at the moment, I've been running workshops with young people who call themselves really anxious about climate change. Um, and so we've been meeting with a lot of experts, we've been meeting as a group and figuring out ways that we can try and combat that climate anxiety. But it's really tricky because climate anxiety is completely um, ingrained in climate anger as well and climate disbelief that the people in power aren't doing enough and climate disillusionment and all these emotions that actually aren't just about us being anxious and needing people to come and consult us, but us actively not being listened to and us actively being dismissed as naive and too radical. Um, and so I think a big element that needs to change in the way we consult young people is trust and knowing that we're coming to this with a wealth of expertise and to be trusted um, with knowledge in our education system and to be trusted that when we bring up um, things that we're angry about, such as the 43% target being really not good enough, and such as um, a university needing to divest from fossil fuels. Um, and then we're told that it's kind of logistical things that we don't understand that's just outside of our depth and to sit back and stay in your little lived experience bubble. I think that's what's missing is, is trust and belief that our radical, beautiful blue sky visions are a form of like really valid knowledge and expertise in this area. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Atina, it's not just young people whose voices in the way that Imogen is describing get get put to the side, but also pretty much anyone who's not big white Western country, right? Uh, what do we do about that? Um, yeah, that's a really great question. Um, well, from my um, experience, because um, I've used to, um, I used to do like um, part-time work with an NGO uh, called the Pacific Islands Climate Action Network, and one of the things that we were really big on was trying to build capacity of young other Pacific young leaders. So we ran things like, you know, um, um, a few weeks long um, COP 20s. Well, it was more geared for COP 26 last year, but you know, just training them for a COP, you know, learning, teaching them about um, loss and damage, climate adaptation, mitigation. Uh, climate finance. So for me, um, you know, how to really center um, Pacific youth firstly, um, include us like from the beginning. Um, uh, it's, it's also, um, you know, they need, uh, we also need, you know, help in building capacity. And so we're really great for um, 
people to take into consideration, you know, need to educate, need to have access to, you know, all these vast wealth of information that is not really accessible to people outside of the global north. So, and um, yeah, just um, centering our voices too. For a long time, I think uh, we weren't talking about doing anything. Well, we were talking about not doing anything because if everybody didn't get involved, what was the point? Which was a bit of a fatalistic argument and really got us nowhere uh, very quickly. And, and it's great that people are all coming together slowly though it is, uh, to, to tackle this. I, I've got some questions. Slido's gone wild. Um, An anonymous asks, from your experience, where has been the best avenue for change? So are we talking governments and policies? Is it businesses? Is it education? Is it grassroots? Individual actions? Joe, do you have a thought? Yes, I have several. <laughs> <laughs> so for me, I think the best way to create change and where I've seen change from my personal actions is A, to get involved in all the grassroots level things that you just listed and get involved in these organizations that people up here are part of, but and really fight for that change at a political level. I think that's where I see the impact coming in. And the last federal election was such a damn breaking moment on that. It was amazing. Um, so really getting in and doing the kind of like uncomfortable conversations person to person. And that's like the political work that you need to do. It's not go up and like, it's not just your vote. There's so much more to it than that. It's like talking to everyone, you know, talking to everyone in your family and getting involved in politics that way. And we talked about earlier, you know, the future of this movement is storytelling. And I think a really effective way to do that is figure out your climate story and bring an element of hope to that story and then communicate that to other people. And then you can really start to see effective change with the people around you. And then if you get involved in political movements and, you know, it could be an NGO or it could be in an actual election campaign, which I encourage everyone to do. And I think Victoria has a state election coming up and I think you we should all get involved because we're in Victoria. Um, but I think it's a conversation piece and it's a storytelling piece and everyone has incredible impact they can make by doing that. Tiana, you have thoughts? I do have a couple of thoughts. Mm. We have seen some great headlines over the last couple of weeks and something that AYCC and SEED worked on for a really long time was Origin Energy trying to frack the Northern Territory and we recently found that they have now pulled out of fracking NT and that was years worth of we had part of the campaign was like frack off Friday and I'm not sure if anyone's seen that and obviously it's a bit of a play on words uh, but that was a lot of early mornings and people standing out the front of Origin and working on the narrative of the destruction to country and a lot of insight into the way that First Nations people were affected by these big companies coming in and fracking their lands and the impacts that that has on the flora and fauna and the water tables and the humans that exist around and on these lands and areas. And so it was really exciting to see the origin have pulled out and it's like, yay, but then also a big sigh because Origin have kind of just passed the football on to another company that they'll now receive ro royalties off of from them potentially fracking the Northern Territory. So it's one of those things that's like a small win but also can't stop the fight there. And a big part of that movement was being able to go out onto country and talk to owners, not just traditional owners, they're still the owners of the country and hear their stories and bring their stories into the cities and the regions and areas that people don't normally hear from the owners up north who are being affected by these things, personalising it and bringing the emotion and, and the empathy into the space so that it's a real issue that you can see. It's not just numbers and statistics that some people just like curl in a ball and rock and go like, I don't know, I'm not a stats person, I'm not sure, but actually hitting people in the heart space of the fear and emotion that comes from that. We also had the history making really exciting part, which I haven't spoken to you, David, about, but super exciting. In the Torres Strait, I'm sure everyone's heard about the United Nations declaring that the government in action on climate change is a human rights issue in the Torres Strait Islands. So this is really, really exciting, not just for Australia and the Torres Straits, but for the whole of the globe to put 
I guess the framework together that what we're what we're doing is not enough and that that has radical movement and power and change behind that we need to be grappling at everything we possibly can to make change in these spaces and look after the people that live on these lands and work in work together and bind together and again that was another thing that was pushed and led by first nations people on country banding together and working together with other people like lawyers and bringing in uh, other experts in the field but it was driven by owners and First Nations people coming together to create that change in that movement. So a couple of really exciting things in the last couple of weeks and some big wins and some slight size of passing the footy on to someone else who's just going to try and destruct country anyway. But it is a sense of relief seeing these wins and we have to celebrate them because otherwise you get tired and cry, which I'm sure everyone has done before. <laughs> <laughs> it does make me uh, look even more eagerly forward to what happens when the voice is enacted here in Australia, uh, just to see what what sort of change that will bring. And, and we are seeing a, an increasing rate of change when it comes to not only the climate, but doing something about it. Uh, I've got another question. I, I'm going to adjust the words a little bit here. Um, so sorry if it's not word for word exactly what you wanted. Uh, again, from Anonymous. There's an obvious divide between youth priorities and those of a world that favours production and capitalism. Do you think we essentially need to break the whole thing and start again uh, to make fast, drastic change? And what does that look like to you? If you think that's the case, uh, how do we get there, Imogen? It's a big question. It is huge. <laughs> I think it's why I love working with youth so much and why I love to surround myself with people who do have those really big blue sky visions. Um, because to me, understanding the absolute crisis we're in at the moment is the same level of understanding and it's this often the same solutions as we have to a whole myriad of problems that stem from capitalism and colonialism and <laughs> emphasis on colonialism there um and so being able to look at the way like where we are and how we got here um and noting that a lot of i think a lot of the work that needs to happen is about actually dreaming of what a better world could look like um and there's some incredible work out there a lot of work with young people um like asking them okay what's an ideal world look like and there's always this beautiful emphasis on community and being embedded with the people around you and with the land around you and so many people we did research with plan international i think in 2020 um and so many people mentioned like bread and fresh bread in the morning and for me holding on to that is the way that the best change then happens is holding on to that dream that um, a society can exist outside of kind of constant exploitation and constant growth. Um, and I don't actually, I don't think that's at odds with an understanding of change as also being sometimes incremental. Um, we talk a lot in criminology about having a dream of um, abolition, of um, exploitative, criminalizing, um, institutions and actually there's a way of getting there that involves a series of small steps um, that always aims to bring power back to community and bring power back to like connection and compassion for each other um, and making sure that those small steps don't re-entrench those exploitative systems but there's a there are um, powerful ways of doing small steps um, that still hold a really beautiful radical version at the end um, and that's a beautiful space, I think, being able to have so much anger at how on earth we managed to get to this type of world, but then holding on to a beautiful vision at the end and having a think about what that vision does for the small steps we do, as opposed to making concessions, but thinking about small steps towards compassion, I guess. I'm going to stay with you for a second, just because I've got another question from, uh, Gemma Everingham, Everingham, Gemma, uh, she asks, well, what are the biggest challenges you've come up against in advocating for change as a young person? Just talking exactly as you, as you were about either tiny steps or big steps. Or what, are, what are those roadblocks? I think um, I've got to acknowledge that as someone who is white and has grown up in a family that went to university, I haven't had to come across nearly as many roadblocks in being able to articulate radical ideas without being dismissed because... Um, I think my whiteness shields me from a lot of um, 
vitriol and anger that gets directed at people of colour who express the exact same ideas um, that I'm, uh, I've learned from, especially Indigenous women on this country. Um, and so for me, a lot of the roadblocks haven't been nearly as pertinent. So I think a lot of my job is, is looking and seeing and listening to people saying, oh, you didn't have that same struggle, um, and then making sure that everything I do is centred on removing those roadblocks wherever possible for people who um, had to work a heck of a lot harder than me to get to where I am. Um, I think a lot of other roadblocks are centred around that type of um, dismissal of young people. I think we we do like media interviews and panels and I think we get reduced to a bit of lived experience and we get reduced to a little bit of inspiration um, where people are like, oh, isn't the future generation nice? Um, and then they get to sit back and not do the big changes that we're asking you to, which means um, better targets and divestment. Um, and I think that's a massive roadblock for me is that sense that, um, yeah, we're existing as a little lived experience inspiration bubble. Um, that isn't taken seriously and that happens in like structural ways as well like when we're consulted we get consulted and they're like oh the youth want 100 percent emissions reduction but they don't really understand do they like that type of um stuff is a big emotional roadblock um as well as just fighting to be heard in the first place even to get into that room with the consultation um and those are that's all i can think of right now that's, but a, I love that, that's great I, I, tina do you do you have a different perspective on the roadblocks well um actually no um not not very different um i have to um you know provide a little bit of context of youth involvement of youth in activism in the pacific Please. it's a little different from um how it's done here uh so i you know coming from another climate vulnerable climate vulnerable region you'll find that uh, a lot of um government aims in re in, in relation to you know, um, climate action are actually very similar to what young people and other NGOs actually um, are are going for. Um, yeah, there there may be some um, differences, but overall, it's the same. So what we what we see in the Pacific is actually you know grassroots NGOs, government actually working together, and a lot of it is always in build up to in the build up to you know the big climate change conference. So for this year, it's COP twenty seven. So in terms of roadblocks. Um, no, um, we don't always, um, we're not barred from the table at all, actually. Um, our government sometimes do want to actually listen to us. In fact, um, the group I'm part of, uh, the Pacific Island Students Fighting Climate Change, are actually supporting the Vanuatu government in its, you know, amplifying uh, amplifying its, um, its case for the ICJ. So it's actually, uh, you know, we're not working, we're actually working in tandem. So basically, yeah. Roadblocks, uh, it's really, you know, just the, the usual, you know, being uh, difficult to gain access to, you know, the big international conferences because of the cost to get there, as well as, you know, um, you know, just pe people not really taking us seriously because we're not from the global north. So that's really, you know, roadblocks that we experience. Mm. I can see, Tiana, again, you've got some thoughts. Interesting on on where to start, I guess, bringing back the the idealistic vision of, of a future of community and um, shared ideas and connection with one another and this like harmonious living. We had that 200 and less than 240 years ago in this country. It's actually not that long ago. First Nations people still live like that where they haven't had extreme torna, torna, trauma and their community torn and ripped apart by colonisation or assimilation or torture or whatever you'd like to refer it as. And obviously we live in 2022 and the history is the history that it is, but there is a humongous wealth of knowledge in First Nations people and in the minds and the systems and the holistic and circular way of thinking, knowing, being and doing to learn with not just from and I think it's an interesting thing when people have ideas and projects about about you know development or moving forward and there's this consultation process which is a bit of a um a fancy fad at the moment which is is good that there's attention to it but people often come in with ideas about a uh, climate project or a conservation project and they'd like the tick off from first nations people about whether it's going to work or not 
Now, these projects and these ideas have been formulated for months or years by a team of people who have taken a really long time to put them all together and find the resources. First Nations consultation needs to happen from the very, very start. You've taken months or years to work out how to get to here, then realise the gap of not engaging properly with First Nations people, and then given our mob a week to go through everything that you've done and give it a tick of approval. That's not consultation. It needs to be co-designed from the get-go. This is what I'm thinking about. What are your mob doing? What would you like? This is your country. What's going on? How can we work together? How can we facilitate spaces with openness and harmony and community to learn from one another in these spaces and move forward? And I work with a lot of Māori mob over in Aotearoa in New Zealand, and they have 60 days for their iwi mob to have consultation. So it's like, yep, you want to have a yarn with our mob about what you're doing? We've got 60 days that we need to go through this. So you can't last minute tick box. They need time to go through and talk with different community members and different elders and different over sections of where lands meet and intersect where there's different languages as well. So 60 days is actually not very long for anyone who does any sort of project management. That's a really short amount of time to pull anything together. But they have this knowing that yes, please engage with us, but please give us the time to do it effectively within our own communities. Because as well as when you're shafted something last minute and your boss says, can you do this by Friday? And you go, oh, not really, but I'll give it my best shot. That's exactly what communities are feeling like when you're giving a, a couple of week or one week deadline, because we can't consult with our community's mem members properly. And then we're not doing our own community consultation within our communities effectively either. So... It's kind of a side note onto that, but I think the harmonious and beautiful community living of a future that looks like that was a was a past reality and is still a reality in a lot of communities all over Australia and all over the world as well. There are still people living in these systems and our need for and desire for continual growth and capitalism and getting bigger and higher and stronger and faster is uh, unattainable, as we all know as well. And I think being able to rewild and connect back into what actually matters and bringing in the narratives and the stories and the hearts of the people behind the buildings and behind the pantsuits and red power lipstick that I'm wearing at the moment because it makes me feel like you'll listen to me. I don't know if it works or not. Please nod. <laughs> <laughs> Is bringing back the people-centric part of who we are as a nation of being one people. We all actually originated from the same place a really long time ago. We're all one collective being and that community mindedness is is so achievable and adaptable and in a world where we try and continually pick and divide and hierarchically move each other between different systems we do have that community mindedness at the at the center of who we are and it might be shriveled up and really small in some people and a, a little bit more apparent in others but it is a potential for the future and learning with first nations people is a really effective way to do that to do po proper consultation and co-design and allowing the spaces to be able to have those conversations. I think people listen to you because you speak so beautifully. <laughs> Just the and the lipstick, <laughs> also the lipstick. Uh, Joe, I, I've got I've got a very popular question for you. Uh, well, not just for you, but uh, Joe. This is from anonymous again. Uh, Joe mentioned the difficult conversations. We're going political. The left and left leaning have often been accused of alienating the right. How can we communicate with climate conservatives and climate deniers to get them on board with climate action? I'm so glad you asked me because um, I didn't get to contribute to that conversation. But, but, but please feel free to add I, your thoughts as well. Yeah, so I'll get to the question, but my roadblocks that I face in this like climate activism journey has been disbelief. Um, at this all exists in the beginning. So I think like I grew up in the Maranoa in Western Queensland and we're in a nice little bubble right now where everything we're saying is accepted and we're all getting around it and feeling positive. My roadblock was con convincing people to begin with that this is an issue and just banging your head against the wall because my community at home is literally on the front line of climate change and they are facing drought after drought and the community is falling apart and yet they don't believe in the science and they're not following this journey and re would reject pretty much everything that's been said in this room today, unfortunately. So 
it's it was it's a real issue when I go home and when I try to do like work at home of how to talk to these people who are conservative in their beliefs and values because essentially what this movement is telling them is that everything in their life is wrong and everything they do is wrong so and I definitely used to fail at this a lot I would go home and I'd be like well the science is telling you this so you're you're wrong and that's that but that doesn't create change that does nothing except make people dislike you and angry so it's like how do you have that conversation and bring those people into this movement and it really is just talking to them where they're at and identifying what hope they can draw from this future world that we're trying to build because going back to what Imogen said before I really think it can be better for all of us and to the question a few times ago, like the system is fundamentally broken and capitalism sucks, we all know it. Um, so, and everyone can benefit from building a new system through the climate movement. And so I think there's tremendous opportunity when you really dig in deep to not be condescending, but acknowledge that a lot of people are turning away because the, conversation can be antagonistic but talk to them where they're at identify what hope they can draw from it and then you can really dig in deep and bring people with you i'm going to stay with you for a second because actually my next question as well uh links nicely to that we're going to go for news you can use which is a very uh very popular term at the moment what advice can you give to younger people out there to bring their ideas forward like you and make their voices louder If you need a second, that's fine. I've got three other amazing panelists. Are you good? Um, to bring your idea forward, I guess what I've learned on that is to try and, you know, you can, this is something I learned from the Waddle Fellowship, is that if you have an idea, you can like, you can create anything out of nothing and turn that idea into a reality. You don't need people's permission and you can, just without any resources, yes, it can be hard and takes a lot of time, but you can take that reality and turn it into something and create effective change from it. And I think, you know, you just don't, you don't need people's permission. You don't need to wait till you get resources or funding. It's like, and you can just create something of your own. And I think that's an effective way people can do that. I'm, go I'm going to needle you just a tiny bit. Be more specific. <laughs> what can people do well it depends on the area of impact they want to have so i think where i used to struggle would be identifying the exact problem that i want to solve so i think step one is to pick and pick an area in the movement that you think is really important and work towards that so you know it can be what i tried to do was i was like okay how do i Trojan horse climate change into my community back home. So I developed a community energy project because I wanted to bring climate and energy back to that space. And so I identified the area that I wanted and then built a little community project around that. So that's kind of like the tangible, something mm. tangible that you could do, but it can take many different forms based on, I would just start with the issue that you're trying to solve. Identify the problem and then go and try to solve it, Atena. What advice specifically do you have for young people to just get out there and get their voices heard? Yeah, sure. Um, well, from my experience, and this is also like my own, um, my, my, my first um, experience into climate activism is, you know, join a group, you know, find people who, um, who, you know, who want to work for the same thing, who, you know, want to uh, raise the issues that we're trying, that we're facing in, you know, in our communities. And, you know, you'll be surprised, you'll find, well, I guess it also depends on your um, your location, like because I come from, a, like I said, I come from a more um, it's um, climate change is slowly becoming to be you know something that everyone is starting to become aware of that you know it's happening in our islands. So it's very it's actually pretty easy to you know find a community, and that's what I did. That's how I got involved with the PISCC. That's how I um, I got involved with you know various um, initiatives back home. It's just finding other youth who are passionate about fighting the climate crisis and you know joining that group and if you have an idea like do not be afraid to share it you'll be you you it might get picked up and if it doesn't get picked up that's okay you can you can go at it on your own it's you know just find your community um also you want to think about you know what's what skills you have 
like for me, I I very I like to read and I like to you know write stuff. So it's what I usually help out with my group. I write I help write press releases. I help to you know um, write speeches for a young a young another person to deliver. Or I even like you know sit on panels and represent my group, <laughs> represent my organization. So yeah, that's um you know find your find your community, find your skill, and utilize that skill. So that's what I would say. All right. So we've got be specific, find your problem, and then find your group, find your people that can help. Imogen. I think um, we're so often fed this kind of idea of how change happens as someone comes up with something and spearheads it. And I really want to echo what you were saying about that idea of finding community and tapping into existing networks that are already there. Because um, I've had to manage this whole really weird balancing act where I'm constantly overestimating myself and constantly underestimating myself. And I assume that I don't have anything to contribute. And then I assume that I can swoop in. Um, and so finding a way to kind of almost humble yourself at noticing what change is already happening and asking yourself, how can I be of service? What type of things can I offer the movement? Um, where can I help as opposed to um, how do I get like this particular opinion out there um, is something I've had to work on, particularly with my particular pos positionality. Um, but I, yeah, I really echo that idea of tapping into existing networks that already exist um, within youth organizations, within fellowships, and having the courage to go up to those existing networks, having the self-confidence to go there and say, can I help? Um, and along with that, noting that a lot of change um, it's tricky for me to say because I'm a politics student and everything is structural and everything wrong with the world is big top-down structure and then noticing that a lot of change can start in very homely ways and in very kind of humble ways in the types of vision and way you conduct yourself in the world and the way you conduct your interactions with the people around you is also a really powerful way to get your voice heard when we're um, sharing opinions with you know, people that exist in our everyday lives and having a way of integrating that kind of radical hope into interpersonal relationships as well. Identify your problem. Surround yourself with a community. Leverage your skills and find your niche and, and where you can help best. I'm so sorry you're last, Tiani, <laughs> because I, there's, I, we've, we've gone through most of the things, but what's your bit of advice for people to get that voice out there? I think there's a really beautiful Japanese term that sort of describes this and it's called ikigai. I'm not sure if anyone's heard of it, but it kind of has like a Venn diagram which speaks about where your skills exist. And I used to work for CSIRO, or CSIRO um, in Indigenous education and I would say to my students about where are your skills, like what do you, what do you love doing that makes you feel full and where's your passion and they're not always the same skills and passion can be different I love the cello but I can't play it but I'm very passionate about listening to it um so where's your skills where's your passion and where is their lack or need and bringing and obviously this is my interpretation of a part of that so I'm not owning ikigai that's not my culture and not my place to talk about but there's beautiful books on that mindset and I think bringing in those aspects of skills, passion and lack, like where's the need, what needs to be uplifted and brought forward into these conversations and into these spaces that isn't there already. I think a lot of people in these spaces kind of fall into accidental like, oh, you know, like David Attenborough is a fantastic story of being like, oh, I was the sound guy and then the person who works with animals didn't rock up. So I picked up a snake and I spoke about it. And now I'm David Attenborough and what an amazing story. Um, anyway, he's obviously passionate about that world in that area and found that there was lack on that day from someone's medical misfortune. Anyway, I'm getting a bit sidetracked because I'm you know, fangirling about David now. Woo. Look, you and me both, that's totally fine. The sexiest over 90 something year old man ever. I literally <laughs> said that on television this morning. Literally. Oh, we are, so good. Oh. Uh, like my soul sibling yes. yeah there we go um <laughs> sorry so in that finding finding what your place and your niche is and that community building is is super important and I think as well the self-care element and being able to have like-minded people that you can vulnerably and openly speak to or like attracts like in society we like getting along with people who are similar to us whether that's what they look like us or 
that they have a similar cultural background or similar interests and things like that. Like attracts like in general until you meet a bunch of yous and then you realise that you're really annoying. <laughs> <laughs> but maintaining self-care and connection, burnout is such a huge reality in this space. I'm only 27 and I I think the whole time being involved in the climate space, I've just continually faced burnout. It's about a two, twice a year occurrence where I get really sick for a bit and then I get up and do exactly the same amount of work that I was doing before I burnt out for another six months. And I think everyone's nodding because it's the reality of the movement. It's a bunch of passionate people who really care about having a better future. And so a lot of people who are committed to the cause will do whatever it takes and often it takes time and sleep <laughs> and energy and emotional energy and a lot of effort of flying between and doing your best in these spaces. So self-care and community and finding when to step up and into something and also when to step back and pass the mic and be like, actually, this isn't my knowledge system. I can't really speak for this. Um, this might be better from someone that I know through my community that I established at the start of this process <laughs> and that I continue to develop as I am on this journey. And I'll pass the mic to them because they might be better in this space. And another part of stepping up and stepping back is I think when I first started in the activism space was the opportunities were coming to speak on panels and things. And at the start, I was like, yes, taking opportunities. I'll step into that place and fill the role. And then it was, you know, understanding that not everything aligns with your moral compass and being able to say no and feel comfortable in saying no that when you're being asked to do something that's outside of your value system or maybe when you're being asked as a environmental tick box or a female tick, bo tick box or a First Nations tick box, which obviously I'm all three, so it looks quite shiny to a rap or to someone who's trying to um, uplift their ego in that space. So I think they're sort of my bits of advice and also learning that, Aboriginal knowledge in management of country or healing country is a lot more than just cultural burns and cultural burns is really really important but if you don't know how Aboriginal people manage country other than burning have a look it's all over the internet and in so many resources there is so much knowledge in our people other than just with fire. Mm. Yeah. So uh, in summary <laughs> find your problem find your community, uh, find your skill sets and where you fit in, and then call Tiani for the rest <laughs> uh, to get you to where you need to be. We are cruelly out of time, uh, really pushing up against it, but I just want in a 30-second, two-sentence, something like that, final push, what do you want, you young'uns, what do you want the world to know, Joe? Uh, what I want this room to know is to get more political and get all your friends political and talk to them and get involved in the state election. <laughs> Brilliant. Imogen. Um, I think just remembering that a better world and a great world is possible and holding on to that um, and remembering that like we, we deserve that um, and not giving up on that kind of radical hope. Very nice. Tiani. A uh, little bit cringe. Change your super and change your banks, firstly, if you haven't done so, and then rally around each other and hold each other up with connection and community and hope to drive each other through this movement. There is such a beautiful future present, and we're talking about hope that is grounded in realism earlier today. What a beautiful quote. Yeah, I'm going to go home with that one for sure. Bettina. Well, we want to help. We, would, we want to... Um... Yeah, we want to help you all. So inclu include us, involve us from the start. And you should be watching ABC News Breakfast at 6am Monday <laughs> to Friday uh, to help change your world a little bit. Please, uh, can you make them feel very welcome and thank them all. So, so wonderful to hear from you all. Thank you so much for speaking so bravely and honestly and openly and intelligently. Uh, Lots more discussion, please. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Goodness. Um, I don't want to even begin to diminish the richness of what we've been through today. I do want to say something. Sorry, I am going to contradict you. I think I am going to use the word inspiring. 
this last session was truly, truly inspiring. And I really want to thank you all for it. It was just extraordinary. Just a couple of quick closing comments, if I may. And I want to actually, again, speak to something else that, Joe, you mentioned, the bubble. We are very much in the bubble. We're in the comfort zone. The real task is to break out of it, and there's plenty of work to be done in that space. I think we've done a great deal today. There's been, there have been many provocations from which we will learn a great deal about what empowerment might look like. There's been a great emphasis on knowledge all sorts of knowledge from all sorts of different quarters, not just academic knowledge, and also different paths for activism and for action. But I think that, for me at least, some of the very powerful me messages that have come through from all of the panels, but specifically uh, this, the last two, was the importance of listening and the importance of diversity and listening to diversity before we act. A lot of people believe they have, that they are empowered, and in fact, a lot of listening would, in fact, perhaps provide them with the degree of respect that, that is required to actually have what I'd call effective hope. So effective hope does depend on that inclusiveness. A lot of today, I think, has been about injustice. Climate change is a vast injustice delivered on different regions, on different generations, different communities. And I think that what we've actually done today is to talk about the ways in which by offering voice, by discovering voice, by enabling voice, we can actually begin to talk about justice and how we get to it intergenerationally between different cultures and between different communities. Um, it's sad, I don't think we have had too many people from government here next time perhaps, because there are a lot of people who could listen very profitably to the stuff that we've heard today. Um, I just want to close firstly by thanking on my behalf and perhaps also for yours both here and virtually, the extraordinary presentations we've heard throughout the day. I think they've been absolutely extraordinary, exceptional presentations. I also want to secondly thank all of you for coming, again, virtually and in presence. It's been, I mean, these events take a lot of effort, but the quality of the, um, people have come up to me and said, oh, you know, you've been facilitating this one. I haven't done a damn thing. It's just happened because of the extraordinary contributions of the people who have been involved. Um, and also from the audience, the questions have been terrific. I also want to thank those from the Melbourne Climate Futures team who've put this together and for Melbourne Climate Futures to host this as an inaugural session. I think it's going to be hard to beat. Sorry, Jackie, you're really going to be working very hard to do that. So again, please join me in particularly thanking the panellists, for their time and for their effort, and also those who are behind the scenes organising this. <laughs> Lastly, I want to hand over to Jackie Peel, who can close the session. Thanks, Jackie. Thanks so much, Peter. I'm not going to take a lot of time because actually I've, I've tried to spend today listening um, to all of the perspectives. And I've written down lots of words, hope, despair, voice, trust, community, passion, connection, story, consultation, country, family, people, openness, beautiful future. I think that sounds better than positive future. So something for us to think about. Um, this is my chance really to say thank you as well to all of you who came today in person, all of you who joined us online, our wonderful panellists, speakers, moderators. A special <laughs> thanks to Peter as um, our MC. And I'd also like to thank all of the people behind the scenes that you don't see when you're attending this conference, but who have helped to make it work. Our, our team from JD, JT Productions at the back, who've been managing all of the technical um, and event organisation, but very dear to my heart, I'd like to thank two of my team who I hope are lurking somewhere in the audience. Um, Beth Barber, who is our comms advisor, and Joe Burns, who is our administrator. If you'd both like to come up, they've thought through every single detail of this conference. Please come up, both of you. I work in comms, so I don't have to come up. 
Thank you. That's so kind. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have earned this wine though. Yeah, yeah. You have earned this wine. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.